you want to know somebody to their core, you spar with them. You know? What is happening? You're listening to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 558, with today's guest, Mr. David Leban. I am Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host. I'm the founder at Whistlekick. I'm a passionate martial artist, and that's why I do what I do, and that's why we do what we do. We're in support of the traditional martial arts, and martial artists, probably people like you, if you want to see everything that we're doing, if you want to know more. Go to whistlekick.com. That's our online home. It's a place to find our store. And if you find something in there you want to grab, use the code PODCAST15 to save yourself 15%. Our podcast has a website all for itself. Whistlekick, martialartsradio.com. We bring you the show twice a week. The goal of the show and of Whistlekick overall, well, it's all under the heading of connecting and educating and entertaining the traditional martial artists of the world. If you want to help the show and the work that we do, there are lots of ways you can help you could make a purchase. You could share an episode. You could follow us on social media. We're at Whistlekick. You could tell a friend, maybe a training partner about what we do. You could pick up one of our books on Amazon. You could leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or Spotify or wherever you're listening. Or you could support our Patreon. dot com slash Whistlekick. That's where we post exclusive content. And if you contribute as little as $2 a month, you get access to some of it. The more you're willing to help us out, help cover the expenses of this show, because yeah, it's not free to make this happen. The more we're going to give you, we've got an exclusive video show with the $10 a month tier. And that's where I'm sharing training tips, things that I have learned, refined. I don't want to say discovered, that's arrogant, but stuff that I've managed to put together that I'm not hearing other people talk about over my decades of training. So if you want to check out what we've got there, patreon.com slash whistlekick. Speaking of video, today's guest, Mr. David Lieben, has made quite a few videos. And I don't mean videos like, oh, I filmed my cat and put it on YouTube, which is pretty much the extent of the videos I make. They're that caliber. No, these are real films, real movies. And people watch them. And one of the movies that our guest today made was about him and his journey to Black Belt. We talk about how that all started. We talk about the journey. We talk about the afterwards. We talk about all. We talk about how his martial arts training is similar to mine, to yours, and how it's not. So without further ado, Mr. Lieban, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Well, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, it's a pleasure to have you here. And you know, we're, we're in similar, I don't know if I want to say climates, you know, listeners, we were, we were talking before that, that you're in Colorado and here I am in Vermont and there almost seems to be, I don't know if you see it from your side, but there seems to be this revolving door between our two states. Between Vermont and Colorado? Yeah. Half the people I know that leave Vermont go to Colorado and, and I'm not exaggerating that either. I mean, I'm from New York originally. So like, I mean, Colorado has a lot of transplants. It's like this huge booming cities and denver is a huge like they they predict like this population is going to triple here over the next 20 years um because we get transplants from california and from the east coast so it's a very desirable place to live it's it's really nice here nice nice and what brought you out there from new york um my i got a job at uh, the university of colorado denver uh as a professor i teach filmmaking there okay yeah cool cool and did you go to NYU? I did not. I went to Brooklyn College. That's, okay. that's where I got my master's. Oh, right on. Yeah. Right on. And at some point in there, there's some, there's some martial arts. Uh, yeah. I mean, I started. When, when, did, how did that start? Uh, when I actually, that, uh, Brooklyn College was my graduate degree, but my undergraduate school was uh, uh, SUNY Oneonta, State University of New York in Oneonta. And uh, they had a karate class there, for, you know, for your phys ed requirement that I took. Oh, nice. And uh, it was Shitoru was the style, if I recall. And I really loved it. It was really terrific. I, I enjoyed that. And that became a thing. All my friends are part of the club. And um, I really, you know, benefited from it a great deal. I really loved it there. 
but then, you know, after uh, college, then finding a job and all these other things, uh, it kind of fell away to the wayside for many years. I didn't really get back into it until I was in my 40s. We've heard we've heard this setup before, right? We've had people come on the show and, you know, they start training as a kid or in college. In fact, we've heard the college aspect a few times and then something life inevitably takes them away logistically, whatever. And maybe it's selection bias because, you know, it's a martial arts podcast. We, we tend to have people who are passionate about martial arts, not so much casual about martial arts. But in almost every case, the guest has remarked that they missed it and they were aware of missing it. And I'm wondering if that holds true for you. It sure does. You know, I was in my mid 40s. I was our second child was born and I was starting to like think like, OK, this is it. Uh, what else is next? You know, and and I started thinking back to some times in my past that were really meaningful to me. And I just had such a fond memory of karate that uh, I was like, well, you know, why don't I do it now? Somebody asked me that question and I couldn't think of good reason not to, you know, uh, so I just found a, um, a style that I liked and a sensei that I, that seemed to have potential. And, uh, I just started again and then I was immediately hooked. Uh, so it was, it was really that simple, you know, like, huh, what's missing? Well, this would be something that would be, I know would, would be beneficial to me in many ways. When we go away from something that really becomes part of who we are, you know, and I think the best example for, for everyone even for people who don't train is, is family. You know, most of us have a good relationship with our family. Most of us appreciate at least the nostalgia of quote, going home, you know, whatever home is, wherever that may be. Did you have any of that feeling when you stepped back in the dojo? Um, go, oh, going back home, you know, not really. Cause I, I felt pretty good where I am, you know, as far as, uh, my home life was concerned, but, um, there was definitely something missing, you know, I'm not a religious person, so I don't have the sense of community that people often get with their, with their religious, uh, uh, spaces. Um, you know, I'm kind of an introvert. So like, I, I, I have to kind of go out and make these connections on my own. Uh, and karate just has like this built in group of people that are like-minded, you know, they have many different, you know, political views and, uh, many different, um, you know, uh, views on all kinds of things. Uh, however, we all are friends and we all are doing this thing together, you know, um, and it, it, there's such a bond created in the dojo that that becomes, you know, um, my new community. And it's, and, it, and I didn't realize how much I needed that sense of community that I just didn't have until I went back to the, to the dojo. Mm. It's interesting that you compare it to the religious component that some people have in their lives, because I, I feel the exact same way we've heard others talk about that. And, you know, it, it's rare, I would say, for martial arts to be taught in a religious context, yeah. but it does seem to occupy that you, you refer to it as community, that that place, that belonging. and. You know, what's one thing that, that the two really have in common? It's a desire to, to grow yes. as individuals. And so as you start unpacking what that looks like for you in this, in this new group of people, you know, what did you find? Is it with, with, with the, the break? I mean, if I'm doing the math right, 20 years or so? Yes. So what, what, was, what, was, what were you noticing that was similar from your past training versus maybe something very different? Hmm. You know, when you're a college student, you know, um, you are, you don't have a career yet. You don't exactly know where your future is going. And so the class is just another class, but you know, it, you know, like you kind of get the sense that this world is temporary. You know, like this uh, karate class, you know, I'm going to not stay in this college town the rest of my life so I can, you know, be a martial artist here. Uh, I knew that I was going to be moving on and going places. So it all had a sense of temporary. And then when, you, when you're doing it and you're, you know, an adult with a job and with a family, it's like it's different now because this can be integrated into your day to day 
in a way that doesn't feel temporary. Like I can keep doing this for the rest of my life if I want to, as long as my sensei keeps, you know, doing his thing or somebody is willing to, you know, pick up where he left off. You know, I, I feel like this community uh, will allow me to maintain as long as I want to with them. So there is that sense of like, you know, uh, you know, uh, longevity. And so with that longevity, I would imagine there's a sense of comfort that kind of comes along. Um, you know, it, it, yeah, I guess there's comfort there. I mean, you know how it is. There's some days where you really want to go and train and there are other days it's like, Oh, I don't really want to go. And then you yeah. get there and you're like, Oh, thank God I went, you know, because that was great. I really I feel so much better. You know, it's, it's just getting out the door. That's the hardest part. You know, once you're there, it's like, Oh, my friends, you know, we, you know, it's, it's just, it, you know, uh, you know, the people that I, I am around, you know, I know them pretty well. I feel like those are my true friends. You know, I, I don't know always exactly what they do in their lives, except I know who they are as people. You know, I know where they stand, you know, like you, you want to know how you want to know somebody to their core, you spar with them, you know, they're, are they bullies? Are they kind? Are they teachers? Are they, are they uh, students? You know, you really get a sense of who they are and uh, the pleasure that we get into, like knowing how to do a kata or knowing how to do the right thing. And, you know, the respect we give one another, it, it all feeds into this, you know, this wonderful kind of relationships that we, that I find myself being a part of. I like what you said. If you want to know who someone is, you spar with them. Yeah. And I think that that's so true. And that was something that I, I first heard maybe 15 years ago, and I didn't get it. I didn't fully understand it. I, no, be, you know, plenty of people spar. And, and, but, but now, now that I'm older, now that I've had a chance to get to know more people, spar with more people and really understand the, the inner workings, I guess, of more people. Yeah, I completely agree. Yes. You know, the bullies don't last long in karate, you know, like, first of all, our sensei doesn't stand for it. And I just don't see it, you know, like people don't go to karate to, you know, beat each other up, you know, like that is not what happens in at least the style that I study, you know, maybe an MMA sort of environment might be a little different, but even then, like those people in that community, they're friends with each other, you know, and they're trying to help each other succeed. Um, you know, I'm a little older. I don't, I don't really want to get beaten up. You know, that's not my thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't think very many people do regardless of age. Yeah, that's probably true. It's not, <laughs> it's not good. <laughs> it's, it's not, you know, martial arts is, is funny. It's, it's what, it's that rare. And I think it's a, a unique environment where your, your best friends are, are the people that you allow to hurt you the most <laughs> yeah you, know, you give them that much more trust yes that they're not going to go too far or if they're trained well enough you know they they know how to go far enough to remind you oh yeah i should have blocked that without breaking my ribs you know they just they, they leave a little note to say oh you should have probably done this you know so. <laughs> <laughs> exactly how did you select this this school i would imagine being where you are, you've got plenty of options. So you, you must've had some decision process. You know, I really like the traditional style of the Japanese traditional styles. And, you know, in college um, I did Shito Ru, as I mentioned, and I was, you know, I wanted to, if I, if there was a Shito Ru school nearby where I live, I probably would have explored that. But I know that Shotokan is very similar in many ways to Shito Ru. So um, I had looked into Shotokan and there was a few more options there. I called up the different schools and I spoke to the instructors there. And I, um, you know, when I met uh, Sensei Swain or I talked to him on the phone, you know, he was very welcoming. You know, he'd been training for 40 years. I think at the time he was a seventh degree. I think now you know, he was a sixth degree. Now he's an eighth degree. Uh, so he's at the master level. And you know, he just was, uh, you know, I was afraid of going back and hurting myself. And, you know, uh, I was, you know, a little wary of sparring because I didn't like, you know, I, I had this thing built and he was like, don't you worry about it. We'll, we'll do the, we'll take it slow. No one's going to hurt you. It's going to be all good. And Shotokan is a style of karate that, you know, he always says this thing where, you know, karate, uh, you don't, karate fits you. 
Uh, it's not the other way around, you know? So like, you know, depending on what you are capable of is what you should put out. Um, you know, he pushes you further and further as you get better and better. But at the same point, like if you have an injury, he wants you to be careful with that. And uh, so he was just very welcoming. And I, and I recognized um, his expertise. You know, I went to another school and there's like a, a you know, it was a, one, it was a strip mall and it was a karate place. And the guy was, you know, I was in my, I was mid forties at the time. And he was, I don't know, I want to say maybe 22. And, you know, he gave me this laminated sheet that had the different packages on there. And this is what it's going to cost. And this is how long it takes to get a black belt. And you'll, and then like I said, okay, thanks. And he goes, I want you to refer to me as sensei. And I hadn't even signed up or anything. It's like, like, yeah, I don't think this is going to work out so well, <laughs> you know, where this school uh, that where I go to, it takes place in a rec center. So it isn't like a, you know, uh, you know, a, a traditional dojo either, but you know, there's something there where like, you know, there's other people working out and playing basketball. Um, but, um, you know, you just pay your fee and you go and, uh, there, you, you know, there's no promises of how long anything is going to take. Uh, it's just, you do it because you want to do it. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're there to get a belt and a and then you're there for the wrong reasons. You know, it's the way this school sort of operates. Yeah, and it's it's funny. You you seem to present kind of the the two major school schools. Not intending to use that word, but I guess it is appropriate. The two schools of schools. You've got people who are very commercially focused, and it, it you know that doesn't necessarily mean that there's a lack of quality in the education, but the the commercial side, the the money, the programs, the structure of what you're stepping into is very front and center. It's very apparent what you're getting into versus sort of the other way where uh, it, it almost seems like these schools pop up and the instructor just wanted to train and teach and, and have some other people to train with. And next thing they know, they're they're running a school with, you know, dozens or even hundreds of people and and saying, oh, I maybe I'm even making some money in doing this. And it, it's, yeah. I, I find it fascinating because there are good and bad schools with both methodologies. For sure. For sure. But as you articulated, one is generally going to make more sense, resonate better for someone looking to train. And it's great that you looked at other schools, not just that one and said, Oh, I'm out. You know, I once went to a, um, a demonstration of Aikido and I was always very interested in Aikido and the whole notion of using the energy of your opponent against them. And, I, and so I, and there's this terrific Aikido school here in Denver that I was planning on going to. And then I went there and, you know, it's a difference. You know, the training involves a lot more throwing and falling and learning how to fall. And, uh, and that wasn't really what I wanted to do when it came down to it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so. Um, I still love to, you know, I, I, the idea of Aikido and, and I admire that, that style, but it, it just wasn't my thing. So like I said before, you know, it's gotta be something that fits you, not the other way around. And I like that visual yeah. quite a bit. I'm, I'm imagining the idea of, you know, the, the, the contrast, right? Yeah. If we're kind of putting on something soft, something flexible, we're fitting it to who we are versus what's the alternative. You're putting on a, a concrete sweater. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's not going to be very pleasant. Maybe you can get yourself into it, but it's not going to feel good. Yeah. If you hate it, you're not going to keep doing it, you know, right. and that's, the, you know, you want to find something that, you know, is going to grow with you. And Shotokan is, it does do that. Like we had a guy, he just recently stopped training, but he was in his nineties. He'd been doing this for most of his adult life. And, oh, cool. you know, like his body clearly was, was older and he couldn't do anything, the same things that he could when he was younger, but he knew all the katas. He was a terrific teacher. He was there moving his body. And, you know, I, it was just evident to me that this is the kind of thing that the kind of uh, exercise and the kind of training that, you know, it may not make you live longer, but I think you'll have a better quality of life if you, if you do it for however long you live. Mm, absolutely. And here's a bit of, I guess we'll call it fortunate and and nerdy trivia. We're recording this on the birthday of the founder of Shotokan. Oh, really? Yeah. Today, today would have been Funakoshi's. Well, is Funakoshi's birthday? Of course, he's long really? gone. But yeah, yeah, yeah. How oh, fun is that? 
That is pretty cool. I'm looking at it <laughs> right now on my shelf. <laughs> yeah. Nice. So this was uh, a few years ago that you started training? Yes, I started. Let me see now. My son is 10. It was nine years ago now. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And so clearly you found a good fit. You've stuck around. And what keeps you going back? Um, well, here, you know, I made this movie uh, called Looking for Mr. Miyagi. Um, and um, so this movie was about me, like part of what, so I'm a filmmaker. And when I make films, I do a lot of sitting and I do a lot of, you know, uh, not moving around. And, and so that coincided with this, you know, desire to return to, to the dojo. And I, and I, so I've been doing it for a couple of years. And then I decided to make a documentary about myself and I'm typically not in front of the camera. I'm not terribly comfortable doing that, but you know, um, you, you use what you have and the resources available. And so I made this movie called, uh, that was for me to get my black belt before I turned 50 and, and the journey to get there, you know, and what it takes to train and how does that impact my family? And what is that, what am I doing that will draw energy from my wife and, and my family and where will I provide more energy? Uh, and so that was where, um, you know, a lot of that was coming from. And then by doing interviews, I, I interviewed, um, you know, many masters and some authors. And, uh, and so I was trying to get to the heart of what it means to be a martial artist, you know, and it wasn't about the belt and it wasn't about, um, you know, beating people up. It was about, yeah, there's self-defense that makes, gives you energy and gives you confidence in other ways. But, uh, it was also really about my personal journey and trying to document that. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I've talked to a few people who have made films and, and being a filmmaker is, it's gotta be one of the most complicated time-consuming creative pursuits that exists. I've written books. Obviously, I've done quite a few episodes of this show. And I've done a little bit of video editing. And I know how much time it makes takes to make a very short video that's very bad. So I can only... I, I can't even fathom the time involved to make something longer that people actually want to watch. What, what compelled you to, to make this story about you? So, you know, when you are an independent filmmaker and you don't have money behind you, it's, you have to kind of look <laughs> at the world around you and what you have access to. And sure. you have to, you know, really do some soul searching because, you know, to make a film, you're committing at least two years of your life to that project, at least. Uh, and so you really have to, you know, think it through. Is this something I want to live with for the next two years? Um, and, you know, as far as access, you know, if my, you know, it was me, you know, uh, I, I know I'm available. <laughs> you know, I know where I live. <laughs> and, and you work for very little. And I'm cheap. Yes. I'm very <laughs> cheap. <laughs> uh, and so, um, you know, I had to present the question to my sensei. Would he be willing to let me film in his class? You know, and I had made a, a, a short documentary with him before I made this film, which is on YouTube. And it's got a lot of views um, and a lot of Shotokan schools use it uh, to, as an introductory tool. And they, they bring their new students in. It's just called Perspectives on Shotokan Karate. And so that's been like all over the world. And, and so he was really pleased that that is getting that kind of visibility more so not because of his ego, but more to kind of let people know about karate and, and what it really is. Uh, and so then I took it one step further and said, hey, would you mind if I brought some friends and they videotape us occasionally training? And, you know, when I took tests, they would videotape the test. And he was very open to it. And he really was, uh, he's a major character in the film, uh, you know. And so, um, you know, the notion of looking for Mr. Miyagi uh, was, you know, a tongue in cheek sort of thing. But at the same point, it wasn't, you know, I wanted to find a teacher who could help me excel in life, you know, as the fictional character would did, you know, mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. but uh, it, it is a time consuming process. You know, when you make it, when you make a fictional film, 
you have a script, you have a blueprint. When you're making a documentary, you're gathering, gathering, gathering in the footage, and then you're sort of figuring it out in the editing room, even though you know the story more or less, it changes depending on what you get. Uh, and so uh, there is a lot of trial and error and experimentation. So documentaries typically take longer to edit and it's a little more complicated, but um, it doesn't mean it's easier or harder. It's just a very different process. One of the, the paradoxes that I've read about that I, I believe extends to documentary films, and I know it more from kind of like the sociology research observational side, is that it's really difficult to observe people without having an impact. And, and when, when naturalists will go out and they observe animals, you know, the rule number one is to not interfere, which can be really difficult. And I've read that the same, well, maybe not same, but it's similar with documentaries, when you're chronicling a person or a subject, it can be really hard not for that film to have an impact. I'm imagining being that you were behind the camera and in front of the camera, that you're driving this, that there was an impact on, on who you are. And I wonder if you might speak to that. For sure. I mean, whenever you bring a camera to any situation, everybody changes at some level, everybody. Uh, you know, it's so honestly, a lot of the times when you get your best material is when they think the camera is off. You know, I always turn off the tally light on my cameras so that, you know, you never really know, you know, I might, you know, make it look like, you know, I'll never use any footage that people wouldn't want me to use without their permission, but I may record some footage without them being aware of it because you get the true person versus the, the person who's on camera. Um, so there is some of that available. And so by putting myself in front of the camera, I sort of made a commitment, you know, like, all right, I'm going to do this. There's been many, there were many times throughout there. I'm like, oh my God, is, am I being self-indulgent? Is this really like, do people want to see this? Is like, am I embarrassing myself? And I would probably answer yes to all above at some level, you know? So I tried to poke fun at myself while I was doing it, you know, I was showing my weaknesses and showing my struggles and, you know, I was trying to lose weight at the time. And, you know, so all that stuff come together. And, you know, I, I, um, I found a guy who's a, a trainer, a physical trainer, and he's also an MMA guy. And he, I think he had a black belt in Taekwondo. So he was, he was really good fighter, like better fighter than I've ever been tough guy, young guy. Uh, but he agreed to be on camera with me and, um, help me train to get there. And so, you know, he would poke fun at me and I would use that material. Cause I, I felt it was important to be a little bit, you know, uh, self-degradating at some level to, you know, so I wasn't full of myself. Uh, so, you know, I, you know, I'm, I felt like I was doing, um, a film of, about anybody going through a midlife crisis, you know? So I, that was really the kind of the idea behind it is that my midlife crisis wasn't a car. It was going back to do karate and people could identify with that is how I, how I saw it. But there were many times that I was like, oh, my God, do I really want to put that out there? This is kind of embarrassing. But I, there are plenty of times where I'm like, OK, just put it in, hit edit. <laughs> you know, so. Most of us, as we train, we have a single perspective. We have how it feels in the moment. You know, maybe we get to look back on photos. Maybe other people will tell stories years later. Oh, I remember the class or I remember the, the tournament or the test where X, Y, Z happens. But it's still from this very subjective point of view. Obviously, you're editing the footage, so there's some subjectivity there. But at the same time, film doesn't lie. <laughs> were there any Were there any moments where you were editing, watching footage go back through, and saying, "I remember that so differently"? Oh my god! I mean. I would say all of it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what feels like a really intense, like in some of the testing uh, footage that I gathered of me going up for these various tests. Um, I think I was purple belt when I first started making the film. And so I was going all the way through and Shotokan, it was like purple. Uh, then there's three levels of brown and then you go up for black. And so I, I, I videotaped all those tests and then we have to spar in those tests. 
And in my mind, it was like, okay, this is pretty intense. And then when I watched the footage, I'm like, wow, that was pretty anemic. You know, like that was like, you know, you know, or if you get punched, it seemed like such a big deal. And you see, you know, you see what it looks like. Eh, it didn't look like much, you know, because we are used to Hollywood, you know, uh, punches and sound effects. And, you know, when you get hit in real life, uh, you know, unless it's some dramatic spinning back kick, it, it's, it's not, it doesn't look all that impressive, even though it can do a lot of damage. Um, so, but I would say that, you know, I, I really enjoy kata and like, I, it was very helpful for me to see myself doing kata. And I feel like I got better at kata by watching myself and filming myself doing it. That was extremely useful. Uh, mm. And, you know, and then of course I can show the parts that I like because I was editing it, you know, but when it came, when it came to sparring though, I, I felt that I needed to show truthful what I was actually doing and what I was capable of. I don't think there's any better tool for your own personal development, especially with forms than our phones or video in general, just watching what we've done. Yes. I've, I've had people struggle to sometimes understand or even believe me when I critique them on something and I'll say, fine, do it again. I grab my phone and I film them and then I show them and they say, oh, and then it's fixed because now they're correlating how it feels to what the result is. And it's yes. such a valuable, practically real-time tool. Yes. Like our sensei will constantly correct this same thing that you're doing over and over. And in your mind, you think, no, I got it. I heard you. But your body isn't doing it because it's, you know, it's a force of habit at this point. So like to really change it up, you kind of have to slow down, really think about the movement. And then by looking at it, you're like, oh, I see. Okay, I get it. Uh, so it does help a great deal. How do you think... And, and I guess there are two ways that we, we could ask this. So I'll, I'll sort of give you both and I'll let you choose how you want to respond. You went through much of the process of your training while making this video. You already said it impacted you. It impacted those around you. How do you think it would have been different? How are you different now than you would have been? Or how would you have been different versus where you are now if you hadn't made this film? Uh, I mean, I probably still would have gone forward to get my black belt and to keep training because I really enjoyed it. In some ways, like the making of the film became a hassle to my training because I had to keep going and had to get camera guys to come and shoot me while I was going to classes. And so in some ways it was definitely a bother uh, to keep, to do it. But um, once it was over though, I um, I really feel like it was a good document of who I am at that time and the, and the struggles I've going through, you know, like um, putting myself out there and allows you to allows me to reflect on who I am as a person and the kind of things that I want to do. And it isn't just about the physical, uh, you know, that was a big part of it as well. Like karate and martial arts is so internal uh, that I think that is one of the biggest things I walked away with from it. So who am I as a person because of it is, you know, I have, a, I have another film under my belt and, you know, it's getting a little bit more play on Amazon now because, you know, if you watch Cobra Kai, I think it shows up as a recommended, you know, thing. If you like that, you'll like this. And oh, cool. uh, so like I, I, what's really, really, really um, rewarding is I get emails from people all over the world or a text message through, in, through um, either Instagram or Messenger from people all over the world say, Hey, I just saw your film. I loved it. Thank you so much. And because of you, I'm going to go back and, and do karate or whatever their martial art is. And so like, it, it was really quite, that to me is the best part of it is like all these people from all over the world reaching out and that, you know, that I've inspired them to do the same, to go back and, and try to do it. So that I really, I love about it. And so, you know, it is very gratifying to see that kind of thing. Mm. I can relate to that. We, we, we get emails periodically from people saying, you know, I started listening to the show and after a few months, I got up the confidence and went back or tried a new school or whatever. And I'm so thankful I did. And, you know, that makes it all worthwhile. Yes. You know, just yep, all, sure. all that investment of time and money and energy yes. to know that it's inspiring someone else to do these things that, that you and I and so many others love. I mean, what's better than that? Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, it's funny too, because when you make a documentary, it's not like, you know, you're not going to get rich off of it. You know, documentaries, you know, there, was, there wasn't going to be any financial payout of it, you know? So, um, 
But, you know, at the same point, you know, as a professor, um, you know, the, uh, the pragmatic part of making a movie for me is as a professor, you have to make or write or do something and then show that you're getting a certain amount of audience or, you know, viewership, or if you're, if you write books, certain amount of sales and that kind of thing. And so, I, you know, making the movie also allowed me to say, look, I did this thing and it's getting these kind of views. It was reviewed in this magazine. It's on this channel and that kind of stuff. So like there is like, you know, value to it for my career at that level. Um, but really it, it was more for me and not because of my job. Got it. Yeah. Any bloopers? Anything oh my God, that, yeah. Yeah. Totally. yeah, is, yeah. Is, there, is there a blooper reel with the movie? That's always one of my favorite parts of movies, especially if there's action scenes. Well, you know what? There, there is a funny, like I, I cut this scene out of the movie. It's not a blooper, but it's a scene that I removed. And I put it up on, on YouTube. It's up there. I could share a link with you where the, the idea was that I was, you know, I was going to have a, like, it was, it was clearly staged. Right. And so that we staged that I had a heart attack in the middle of the, of a class and my friends had to like drag me away to the hospital. And, you know, so we did it like tongue in cheek and it was meant to be funny. And it clearly looks fictional compared to everything else in the film. Uh, and I, and I still think it's really funny. Uh, and I enjoy looking at that, you know, where my friends are like throwing me actually they're my students from school who are filmmakers, uh, at the time. And, you know, they tried to pick me up and throw me in the car and, you know, who drives a <laughs> stick? I don't drive a stick. You drive a stick, you know? <laughs> uh, and so that's out there. Um, and, um, I also have some, I interviewed, uh, master Okazaki before he passed. And, um, um, I, so that some of that stuff didn't make it to the movie. And so I've got a whole story about how, um, he, uh, um, I think it was Funakoshi's cat. Like he studied under Funakoshi and the, he tells a story about how like he had to wait in a, um, he had to wait. He showed up at the house and he was waiting for him to come out there. And this cat, well, his phone Koshi's cat was like sitting there and like kind of kicks him away. And so like, it was, it was sort of like, Funakoshi sort of knew it at, so he tells the story better than I do and I encourage you to go look at that but it's really <laughs> funny if you look up Funakoshi's cat and you'll see Master Okazaki talking about that nice yeah, yeah if, if you could send over those links we'll make sure that we get all the links in. For sure, just, just in case we have somebody listening who's new to the show and maybe skipped over the intro you know we 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 have show notes up and, and they're probably in your podcast player but they're also at whistlekickmarshalartsradio.com for sure I'll send you that oh that'd be great and um, also, um, there's a, you know the kind of some of the other stuff I cut out was like, you know, there was the legal ramifications of using karate um, or your martial art. Um, and so, you know, while it was interesting, you know, it, it wasn't didn't bring it wasn't about that story wasn't related to my story about trying to get the black belt before I turned fifty. So, you know, although I do delve into what it means to be a martial artist, um, some of that stuff just seemed you know, extraneous to the, to the main story and have to kind of keep it tighter. Sure. So I'll send you sure. those links too. Please do. Please do. Yeah. I appreciate that. And so what does your training look like now? And, and well, before, let me ask you an important question. Did, did you achieve your showdown before 50? Uh, so I'm going to give away, a, can I give a spoiler to the movie? <laughs> hey, that's up to you. That's, a, that's <laughs> I mean, up to you. I mean, spoiler alert. So, you know, if, yeah. if anybody doesn't, is is gonna and I hope people will watch the movie, uh, but maybe skip yeah. ahead thirty seconds. Go yes. Ahead. <laughs> so yeah, it's a, so I did not get my black belt at the end of the movie. Like I failed my exam, uh, and so um, uh, what the movie ends on is me, you know, having to retest, and I and I leave it there, and and I thought it was, and I and I had a lot of discussions do i just keep making the movie until i pass because that's the expectation people think like well that sucks i wait you know i want to see if he got it or not but the truth of it is it isn't about the black belt and that was really what the whole message of the film was it isn't the belt you know so i felt that that was more valuable than seeing me get my black belt even though it's sort of disappointing to see me fail um uh, or get a retest. They don't like to use the word fail, but let's face it, I failed. <laughs> <You know>? but, <laughs> but six months later, after I finished the film, I did get my black belt. I passed and 
Um, I have a, there's a video out there also of uh, me actually succeeding on, on the next test. Uh, so that's the question that I get from people when they email me, did you ever get your black belt? So now I have it. I, so I was in my fifties when I got in my year 50, but I did not get it before I turned 50. Was that, was that, a, how do I want to ask you? How did that feel? Getting my black belt? No, that, that you would kind of put out this, this, this goal. And, you know, depending on how you look at it, it was either a target and you got really darn close because you shot from pretty far. Yeah. Or maybe you didn't. And I, and I guess how you feel depend depends a lot on, on how you look at things. And so I think we'll learn something about you as you answer. I mean, I was disappointed, obviously. Like, it's very nerve-wracking to go through these tests and have these people evaluate you and they got a pencil and a clipboard and they're writing things down, you know? So, like, um, it's, uh, it was definitely a disappointment. But, you know, as far as the film was concerned, uh, I felt I needed to be true to the movie. Like, I turned 50 and I still hadn't gotten it. And, and you know, upon reflection and everything that you'll hear the senseis say in the film, it doesn't matter. You know, it really doesn't because uh, it's not like anything is going to like, you know, balloons aren't going to fall out of the sky. Like, you know, you, the day you pass your show on, you know, the you're excited for, you know, a day or two. And then, you know, you're back in the dojo and it feels like you're starting from scratch again because now the expectations are higher, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I feel like uh, it was a, a great learning experience. And, and also the fact that I didn't pass really made me in a way value the scrutiny of my dojo and the people that run that, that club, because they're not just giving it away because, you know, you're, they feel bad for you or, you know, they have, they have integrity. They say, okay, we'll give it to you when you earn it. You didn't earn it yet. You got to work on these things still. And, and that gives me pleasure in knowing that I've achieved it. I've gotten to that neck, to that level. And there's more value to it than just giving it away. Yeah. And so how about, Here's one. What would you now, if you could go back and talk to you, let's say, as you were contemplating this documentary, what would you say to you then? Listeners know this is one of my favorite questions. Don't bother trying to get distribution. <laughs> <laughs> I tried just, you know, just, and I was hoping I, I was I was, you know, when you're making a movie, you have delusions of grandeur. Oh, this is going to be the best thing ever. Oh, everyone's going to love this. And, and that's, and that's really important for you to actually complete the movie. Like you have to have that notion and otherwise it's very hard to, for me to keep going. Uh, but I would probably tell myself that, you know, don't expect great things of it as far as, you know, career changing at the same point, just know that the film will have value to many people. So just keep going. Don't be discouraged. Don't worry about how you're being perceived by other people. Just do it. Cause that, that, I, there was a lot of self doubt in making the film that, you know, that was, that was struggled with more than the, the, the realities of making a movie. It was just, you know, the, you know, putting myself out there is, you know, a risky thing. And as far as your ego is concerned. And so I would probably give myself a little bit of break with that. What does your life look like outside of training? And, and I guess I'm asking that because I'm, I'm wondering how this all fits together. You sound like a pretty busy guy. You've got family, you've got your career, you've got your training. And then somehow through that, you said, I'm also going to add in this movie, which as you <laughs> said, was multiple years of a commitment. Yes. So give um, us some context. So I am still making movies on this. Um, and you asked earlier about where I am now with martial arts. And so there was COVID. And then I was also, make, I finished another film. Just It just was released in September of 20. Oh, wow. And uh, it's a science fiction drama, which is on Amazon. If anyone's interested, it's called A Feral World. It's a coming of age story in a post-apocalyptic world. And that was a huge project. It was a five-year endeavor. Um, and, um, you know, so that cut into my martial arts quite a bit, you know, I had to like focus on that and my mind was on that. And so it was very difficult me for me to like stay engaged as much as I used to be. So I was still for the first few years, I was still training regularly. And then as I got to near completing it, I, I honestly took off about eight, nine months. 
Uh, and so I've just recently started back uh, once the dojo opened back up, you know, because of the pandemic. And so I started back. So I was eight, nine months off. And uh, I am now back in for about two months, and I feel like my my uh, my skills are starting to come back. I'm starting to remember. Now, there's definitely those first few weeks were really quite difficult, um, but you know. So in the grand scheme of things, you know, it keeps me centered. You know, I'm sure you hear this from a lot of people. So because I am doing all these other things, and I have students, and I have faculty I work with, and I'm making movies, and I'm trying to do that. This is the one thing that really like gets me out of my own head. And it's very important for me. And I realized when I wasn't doing it, how much my, my psyche is not as healthy as when I am training. Uh, so, uh, I, you know, I re- by being away, it made me value it even that much more. Mm. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And are you, are you going to keep making films? I mean, is it, is this, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, I, yeah. So, a feral world. What's the next out. one? So, I made. Uh, I've written. I've written a script, um, and I'm currently trying to. This one, I'm trying to do a little bit less on the crowdfunding kind of way. I'm trying to actually uh, raise a budget and get known talent associated with it. And I'm getting a, you know some feedback from film festivals who really like the script, and people are are calling me. And so we're we're, we're in discussions and you know, nothing has happened yet. You hear this, you know, making movies that everyone tells you, oh yeah, this is going to be the best thing ever. So, you know, until you're actually on set shooting and the money's in the bank, it's all just pretend, <laughs> you know, but um, uh, it's a, it, this one is going to be a dark comedy. It's kind of like a Coen brothers type film. It's currently called publish or perish. Uh, and so that's what I have written that script. And I'm hoping that we'll be able to shoot it uh, in June of 21, at least that's the idea. And instead of spreading it out over four years, uh, a feral world, we shot it in four segments. And so kind of like that film boyhood, you get to see the lead character who it was 11 when we started, he ended up being, you know, 15 when we finished the film, shooting the film. So you get to see him age over the course of the movie. We're not going to do that again. We're going to do it all in one, like, uh, you know, one month shooting period. And then we'll, you know, work on getting it distributed and that kind of thing. Any martial arts in that film? Um, no, there isn't. None. I mean, there's. I mean, I, I, there are there are some fights and there is some gun fa- gun fighting and stuff like that. But um, the guys that are doing the fighting are not martial artists. They are old guys who don't know how to fight. And there's. And I'm, <laughs> I, I'm imagining comedy in that because you know they they can throw punches, but they don't know what they're doing. And I think I want to play it off as kind of like a kind of a sad <laughs> altercation, you know? Mm, so, I get it. That's yeah. Awesome. You know, awesome. I do take away like, I mean, this is like a little side track here, but, you know, looking at movies where I do see martial arts, you know, cause I do know martial arts and I do know to some degree how to protect myself. You know, when you see like two people, standing each other down. And I'm sure you think the same thing as a martial artist when somebody gets right in your face and they look at you and they're like trying to intimidate you. The first thing that I go is, Oh, that's a bad move to get so close to me. I'm going to tear you apart. (laughs) You know, like they try to intimidate you, but like, if you know, martial arts as the last thing you want to do, get into their space like that. (laughs) And most martial artists aren't going to just stand there and let them step up. Oh, no. we're going to keep oh. some distance. There's going to be some shifting. Yes. You know, it, it's, uh, it, it's really interesting. In fact, we were recording a Thursday episode earlier, uh, talking about, uh, firearms of all things uh-huh. and how so much of what we think about when we train and what we see in films and how we train to handle firearms, respond to them as, as, uh, in a self-defense context, how it, it doesn't all jive, right? It, it's all, it's all these interesting different perspectives. You know, most, most fight scenes in martial arts, uh, in, in non-martial arts films anyway, have no reality to them. Yeah. The psychology on how they start, you know, like you just said, you know, two people getting in each other's faces, that doesn't happen a whole lot. I dare, I wait for sure that part and he's like, oh, I dare you. <laughs> get close enough that you can't see where my foot's going to go next you know a, a, or anything i got all kinds yeah. of things at my disposal <laughs> <laughs> yeah nice. 
Nice. No, but so like I look at some movies where I like a movie. Have you ever seen the movie Collateral with, with Tom Cruise? Yes. So like that kind of like the martial arts in that movie are very realistic to me. It's just like, bam, bam, move on. Like I just broke your knee. I'm not going to stand around and do any spinning flying kicks. I just did that. I'm moving forward. Like that to me struck me. There's, it was pretty reality based. I mean, granted it was dramatized and over the top in a lot of ways, but I, I felt like that was a pretty authentic uh, um, design of the choreography of those fight sequences. Mm. I generally ask folks involved in the film industry about their favorite martial arts films and, and favorite actors. And I, I want to add a, a third piece and you can answer these in any order. Do you have any desire to direct choreograph any, any of these uh, more, let's say traditional martial arts film elements that martial artists often go on to work on? I mean, I would love to have that experience, but I would have to be perfectly honest. I would need to collaborate with uh, a fight choreographer. Like it, I would say my strong suit as a director is really about getting people's performance to be, um, you know, to be authentic. So, you know, I would surround myself with the right choreographers who know how to do this sort of thing. And, you know, we would have discussions on, uh, you know, what do you want it to be like really crazy over the top or do you want it to be more realistic? Or, you know, once you once you identify the tone that you're going for, then you design the kind of fight sequences that are out there. Like John Wick, for example, like I love those movies. You know, they're crazy dumb, but like they're so fun. You know, like I, I love that kind of thing. Yeah. So I don't you know, truthfully, I don't know if that's in my wheelhouse. Um, you know, I I would love to have that opportunity, but I think you know, where I am in my career, I think it's more likely for me to do, you know, drama and comedy as opposed to doing martial arts film. But if somebody come, came to me and said, let's do this, I, I would know how to surround myself with the right people to get it done. Nice. Yeah, nice. that makes sense. I get it. And let's, let's turn our, our eyes forward in a, a non-film way. What are your martial arts goals? Hmm. You know, that's a great question because uh, I, I've just been thinking a lot about that recently. So, you know, I'm two months back in after my, my time off and uh, I'm starting to feel uh, things starting to click again. And I have my, uh, um, you know, I have a little bit more uh, ability to maintain and keep going forward. You know, I would say I'm still a showdown. I think giving myself goals is really helpful. I don't think having, um, uh, a next level of a belt is going to change my life in any way, except it gives me something to strive for. So I would like to, you know, work on getting my knee done. And, uh, and I think, you know, I was getting really close to, to doing that before I, I dropped out of it. And so I just have to kind of build back up there. So it would be really just, um, to get back to that level. And, uh, and one day I think I would enjoy teaching karate. Um, but it's, that's not a, a really driving force for me. It's like, I, I'd say, I want to, uh, just be good at it again and, you know, be in that headspace and think I enjoy like doing kata forms. You know, I, I enjoy like imagining what these moves actually represent and what they're supposed to be. And, and the more you do it, the better you get at it. And so it's just really great to kind of be in that world. So, yeah, I get it. Roundabout answer. I get it. No, Hey, there, there are, there are rarely straight path answers on martial arts radio. And that's <laughs> yeah. one of the things I love about the show because you know, it's not, it's not the destination, it's the journey, right? So I can ask you a question. You might get there in a convoluted <laughs> way, but we, we get so much good stuff as we go. And I, and I love that. For sure. Yeah. Right. Well, if people want to check out the films that you've made or social media, email, like what, what are the relevant addresses for folks? So if you want to see Mr. Miyagi, uh, looking for Mr. Miyagi, uh, you can find that on Amazon. It's there. Um, just uh, you'll get when you start typing in looking for Mr. It'll come up looking for Mr. Good, good bar. So you just got to keep putting in that M. <laughs> so, um, but it's there. Uh, if you want, or if you wanted to get it online, you can uh, find it at Mr. Miyagi.net. Um, and then uh, as far as my other movies, uh, A Feral World, that one is on 
uh, Amazon and iTunes and a bunch of other places as well. Um, and then as far as if they just wanted to reach out to me, um, if you went to a feralworld.net, uh, there's an email link there and I'd be happy to, I'd be happy to entertain any questions or comments or whatever. Well, I appreciate, I appreciate you being here. And again, to listeners, we're going to link all that stuff in the show notes. And I've got one final thing for you. One final, I guess, question. And that is what are your final words? You know, what do you want to leave the listeners with today as we fade to the outro? Just keep training. I think I kind of covered it all, you know, but um, I would really say that, you know, find the meaning in what it is that you do. Why do you do karate? Why do you do martial arts? And, you know, what I have found that it really expands way beyond just the training. One of the things that struck me is when I was when I was preparing to make my documentary, looking for Mr. Miyagi, and I brought my my the treatment, the paperwork to my sensei and say, Hey, look, I'm looking, thinking about making this movie. And I'd written up this document and talking about the goals and what I hope to get out of it and, and all that kind of stuff. And he said, he looked at the document, he goes, this is karate. And I didn't really get it at the time. And then the more I thought about it, it was that karate is, you know, a word, but martial arts and is really, uh, you know, seeking, you know, seek, seeking a perfection, you know, like, um, that would, you know, trying to improve yourself, do, do good work and, and just keep on training and, and thinking about the, 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 the kind of life you want to live. I know how challenging it can be to put myself out there. I know that one of the most critical demographics in the world are martial artists. When they get hold of video of other martial artists doing martial arts. So the idea that David would film himself working towards his black belt shows a level of, of confidence and passion that I think is utterly powerful. I am moved by this. And if you haven't checked out the film, if you haven't checked out his websites and what he's got going on, I hope you will. As you know, I'm a supporter of any content around martial arts, whether it's someone else with a podcast or films or books, what, whatever it is. I want more martial arts content out there because I think that's how we reach both martial artists and non-martial artists. It's no small feat to make any kind of film. So I applaud the effort and I thank him for the effort. Thank you, David. And thanks for coming on the show. Head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for the show notes, all the different links that we talked about today. And every episode, remember, it's got a page all by itself. You can leave comments and check out all the other things that we've got going there. Sign up for the newsletter, all that good stuff. And if you want to support us and the work that we do, you've got lots of options. You could make a purchase. You could tell a friend. You could contribute to the Patreon. Patreon.com slash Whistlekick. If you see somebody out in the world wearing something with Whistlekick on it, maybe a pair of sweatpants or a hat or something like that, say hi. Introduce yourself. We are a growing community. And remember, we have more that binds us than divides us. We are all martial artists. If you have feedback for me, email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. That's it for now. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. <laughs>